In the heart of England is a company unlike any other. It's famed for its achievements in engineering and design. It has been driving innovation for over 80 years. That company is British car maker Jaguar. Now, it's embarking on its greatest ever challenge. Going electric. For a historic brand like Jaguar, making its first electric car, the I-Pace marks a giant leap into the future. Its engineers and designers will need to give everything if they're to succeed. The first big change in 100 years in the motor industry, and that's the real challenge for us. This is a world where technical excellence meets exquisite craftsmanship. You're using tools to make something come alive. Where testing is taken to the extremes. This hydraulic rig has the capability to actually destroy the vehicle. And the car pushed to the limit. The car's going through a hell of a test with that temperature and the speed that it's doing. With exclusive behind-the-scenes access to Jaguar's state-of-the-art engineering laboratories and top-secret design studios, this is the story of how Jaguar set out to make the radical new I-Pace. If somebody had said to me, one day, 50 years from now, this is what you'll be doing, I'd have found that very difficult to believe. And of the change it heralds for society. The I-PACE program began here at Jaguar in 2014. For the thousands of people behind it, the magnitude of the project was clear. If they could succeed, the I-PACE would become the most significant new Jaguar in the brand's long history and mark a seismic shift in the future of the company and of transport itself. But questions remained. The company has a proud heritage, producing some of the world's greatest cars. Yet none of them have ever been electric. Could Jaguar rise to the challenge? Or would its history hold it back? The man tasked with designing the I-PACE was Ian Callum. He's been Jaguar's director of design for nearly 20 years. And with a classic car collection of his own, he's a petrol head through and through. For him, heritage is something to be celebrated and to learn from. A car designed as a beautiful car will always be beautiful. It's that simple. And these, to me, are beautiful cars. And, you know, I enjoy their very existence. I probably don't drive them enough. I probably look at them more than drive them. I probably clean them more than drive them. But they're significant to me in that I just enjoy the aesthetics and I enjoy what they stand for in the history of these various brands. Ian's car collection is varied, to say the least. So this is one of my very favourites, my 32 Ford Hot Rod. Great looking car, I've spent many years building this and rebuilding this with various friends to get it to the state it is today. I fell in love with Hot Rods when I was a youngster 
and uh, what I liked about them, they were rebellious. I was a teenager, I thought this was the ultimate statement of a teenager. So I wanted to have a hot rod because it, it flew in the face of convention. Back then, despite his obsession with hot rods, one brand stood out for Ian more than any other. I fell in love with Jaguar at a very young age, and I think probably because it was the most significant exotic car I would see in my everyday life growing up in a small provincial town. There were Jaguars around, and I wanted to be part of the Jaguar world. So I wrote to Bill Haynes, who was the vice president of Jaguar Cars at that time, 1968, and uh, I wrote to him and said, how do I become a car designer? And uh, I sent him some drawings, and he wrote back. So this is what the letter says. It says, Dear Ian, I thank you for your further letter and drawings, which I have looked at. It is apparent that you intend to enter the styling side of the industry, and in the course of your career, it would do well to take some art training. The drawings he sent back, they're here. I still have them. I still look at them and think, have you improved? A little bit. And guess what? They're all Jaguars. They're not bad, actually. I've got one here, which is a limousine. And this is very much a sports car, a lot of sports cars in there. And I, I can remember to this day quite clearly that letter arriving from Jaguar, you know, it's from, it was from outer space, it was from another planet. And that feeling I had that day is so strong, I feel I owe it to that 13-year-old boy to continue through with that story. Inspired by the letter, Ian went on to design and work on cars for the likes of Ford, Volvo, and Aston Martin. But becoming Jaguar's director of design in 1999 was the realization of his childhood dream. 15 years later, taking on the I-Pace would be his biggest ever challenge. When you set out in something this different, of course you have an, uh, a, a sense of nervousness. But it's, it's a nervousness with adrenaline. Ian's appreciation of motoring history only added to the nerves. Because the story of the electric car is far longer than you might think. The first practical electric vehicles were developed in the 1880s. And by 1897, Fleets of electric taxis were working the streets of New York and London. By the turn of the century, electric cars were outselling petrol cars in America. The world land speed record had been broken by an electric car in France. The first ever car to exceed 100 kilometers an hour. And within a decade, electric cars were driving 100 miles on a single charge. Surely they would play a major role in the 20th century. But it was not to be. Back in Detroit, Henry Ford wondered how he could bring the price of the Model T down to where everybody could buy it. In 1908, Ford launched the petrol-powered Model T. Within 20 years, the company had made 15 million of them, and the success of the internal combustion engine had all but killed off the electric car. For most of the 20th century, the majority of the world's battery electric road vehicles were things like British milk floats. But then came American electric car maker, Tesla. I've got an enormous amount of respect for Tesla. They made it respectable, they made it cool, they made it fashionable. So it was a wonderful move at the right time to create something uh, which we actually need. This time round, the electric car is here to stay. The question was, could a relatively small and historic firm like Jaguar successfully bring one to market? The company's electric I-Pace first started taking shape here in its advanced design studio. The team knew that creating an electric car 
would allow them to do things very differently. Exterior designer Matt Bevan had a key role from the beginning. In the early stages, it's all about the, the fundamental proportions of the car. That's the most important thing for us. If you don't get the proportions right, you will struggle all the way through to make a nice looking design. We've got all the opportunity in the world here to do something quite special. Mm -hmm. We're designing an electric car, we've got the battery at the bottom. Yeah. But apart from that, we've got a lot of freedom like never before. It's a very exciting time to be an automotive designer at the moment. And when the iPACE programme landed on our desk, it was just amazing because it's very rare you get a clean piece of paper like this programme. But also quite daunting because Jaguar, with all the history and the heritage, we have to have a very clear vision of where we're going with this car. Being electric, the iPACE doesn't have an engine, and that changes everything. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, a Jaguar has to have a long bonnet. No, it doesn't. It had a long bonnet because it had a big engine. We don't have a big engine anymore, therefore it doesn't need a long bonnet. Therefore, we can reassess the proportions of the car. We'll move people forward. Absolutely, yeah. So we yeah. move the people forward, Yeah. and we move the cabin forward, so we'll put the cabin yeah. like so, yeah? So it's actually heading towards the front wheels. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So we have the short fender on the front and then the long fender on the rear, and it really does help to give that kind of cab forward look to the vehicle. Yeah, and really throw it all forward. Yeah. Yeah. Controversial. Very different, but I think this... Uh, I think it'll work. I think, I think it's think going to work. Really, yeah. really nice proportion. This cab forward design maximises interior space, giving ample room for five adults. So it's all about the drama of the front haunch and then the rear haunch sweeping back. All right, yeah. Fantastic. Should be fun. Yeah. From the earliest sketches, the I-Pace was unlike anything Jaguar had made before. At first glance, it couldn't have been further from the classics of the company's 1960s heyday. But Jaguar has always embraced the future. When you look at the classic Jaguars like the E-Type, they were very revolutionary in the time. They never looked back too much. They always looked forward. And so that's our motto really here. This is all about creating new designs and exploiting new technology. A bit more. Sit. The most significant piece of new technology in the iPACE can be found here. Right, let go. This is the long range battery around which the car will be built. Stop there. For a company famed for its internal combustion engine cars, nothing could be more representative of the future than this. Today, the team are working on an early version of the battery. Lead engineer Dr. Danson Joseph has played a crucial role in its development. So this is one of our early prototypes of the battery. It's fairly large. It basically fits from the rear wheels to the front wheels. So the lowest point of this battery is the lowest point of the vehicle. Known affectionately as the skateboard, the low-slung battery is what provided the designers with such freedom in their quest for the perfect design. But getting this far was no easy task. This is a, a big shift for Jaguar because this is not built on another vehicle platform. This is a platform in its own right, which is something that other manufacturers have not engaged with very much. They've tried to adopt their existing vehicles. Jaguar has taken the approach of an electric vehicle is a different vehicle. Let's make it differently. So we've had to understand new ways of manufacturing different ways of assembling elements of this pack that makes it good for manufacture, good for service, but simple enough that it won't fail. At the heart of the battery are 432 temperature-controlled pouch cells designed to give the car a range of 292 miles and recharge to 80% in less than 40 minutes. So we've got to a point where the range of an electric vehicle is something that people can relate to their daily lives. But a high-performance, long-range battery is only any use if the infrastructure exists to charge it. 
and not just at home, where the vast majority of charging occurs, but out in public, right across the country, which is where the contents of this box comes in. John and Jason are in Dorset, heading for the market town of Wimborne. Their job today will see the UK's public charging network grow a little further. Up ahead, their colleague Tom, an expert in the nation's electric infrastructure. In terms of the charging point infrastructure, uh, we've gone from around 3,000 public charging points in the UK to around 16,000. Tom and the team work for Chargemaster, one of a number of companies installing electric charging points nationwide. With rapid growth in the number of electric cars, it's a job that keeps them busy. Today, they're installing two chargers in a school car park. Hi, guys. Hiya. Good morning. Good morning, Jason. How are Hi you? There. Hi there. We've got two cables here. Uh, we've got a rapid charger cable on the left there, so that's your sort of short stay bay. So typically with a rapid charger, you're looking at about a half an hour stay, 80% full. And on the right here, we've got one for what we call a fast charge. So that's a dwell time of maybe an hour, two hours or more. The electricity will be drawn directly from the UK's national grid. We've got the, the high voltage cable map here. So we're, we're just about here. You've got a substation just over there. Uh, and that's where effectively the high voltage system's coming in. So there's actually a cable that's running under the road over there and to those units. From its beginnings in 1926, the national grid electrified the country. At the touch of a switch, they had heat. They had light. They had music. Cities, factories, and homes. Every aspect of life was transformed by electricity. Except one. It is only now, in the 21st century, that the grid is powering large numbers of cars. But the novelty should soon fade. If you think about it, a rapid charge is just another piece of electrical equipment. We put electrical equipment in our houses, we put it in commercial applications. So really, it's not any different other than it's a different type of electrical equipment. There's a huge growing market, so we expect there to be rapid charges, for example, at most motorway junctions within the next couple of years. And you'll see them spread up all around the country. OK. OK. Ready to go. OK. Beautiful. So the aim of this is basically it's a short kind of pit stop when someone's maybe dashing in to get a coffee, maybe picking one of the kids up from school and that kind of thing. So it's, it's a rapid charge to charge a car as fast as it can charge. The installation takes little time and the team are soon packing up, ready for the next job. By 2023, it's estimated there will be up to 100,000 public charging points and over a million electric cars on British roads. Back in the design studio, Ian and Matt's early sketches of the iPACE are being converted into 3D digital models using CAD software. When you provide you with a 2D image, the beauty about the CAD is that you can actually bring that image to life with a three-dimensional model. It allows you to add the detail. You can inspect it with the highlights to give you the car that you want. Months of creative effort are now beginning to show. But for the designers, seeing the car take shape on screen isn't enough. Which is where Ian Astbury and his clay milling machine comes in. This is technical modeling clay. It has been loaded by hand onto an outline of the car created using the CAD data. Ian's job is to cut it to shape. From start to finish, with rough cuts and finished cuts, we could probably do a full car in about five days. The drill bit follows a pre-programmed route, shaping the car with utmost precision. This has got people's handprints on it, the thumbprints on it, and 
hard work and sweat. It is great to see it coming out of just a lump of clay. You can't get a sense of what it's going to be on a screen. I feel like it's an important moment because it's, it's the birth of something, really, isn't it? And it's fantastic to see models that are in the next few years going to be on the road. And being part of that is awesome. But the final crafting is not a job for machines. It's really important for us to be able to use our hands to figure out what's going on. You know, for me to just rub my hand across that, I'll be able to tell what's going on, where the clay needs to come out, where it needs to go back on. With a machine, obviously, it won't do that. It will give you just one surface and that'll be it. So the, the human element to it is massively important um, because without that love and care that you, you know, put into a model, it wouldn't be the same if it was just done by machines. Every car you see on the road is actually a work of art. It's a work of somebody's art. Somebody somewhere has sculpted that by hand to get it to where it is, to what you see. The teamwork with clay created especially for the automotive industry. It contains a mix of waxes and plastics to ensure it never fully dries. It's more of an art form than technical, I would say, because you're sculpting clay. You know, you're sculpting a car. You're using clay and you're using tools to make something come alive. It is a sculpture in a sense. We've got a lot of younger people coming through now, and uh, we're training them up to have the same passion as the, the guys I grew up with and, and knew. And they are real artisans. They can really move and sculpt that clay with loving care. I absolutely love the job, yet yeah. I love cars and I love art, so for me it's a perfect job. Really enjoy it. Today, the modelling team are preparing for a viewing with the designers. Attention to detail is everything. I'm just cutting the lamps out, just ready for the review with Ian Callum, just so that it can look a bit more realistic on this side. Ultimately, you want to see what the customer sees in the showroom, so details like this matter. You want the product that looks professional. You want all the reflections of the light to bounce off the surfaces in a true form. And with using these different shapes of slicks and tools, we can get the surface how you'd like it. Even the finest of details are checked by eye. This piece of wood is what we call a spline, and we use it to check the curvature of a surface. As you can see, there's a little bit of light under the spline, and that means that the surface is hollow in one place or maybe a bit too full in another. And we need to get rid of that light because that means the highlight on the surface won't run very well. It's taken days of dedicated effort, but finally the clay eye pace is ready. For the design team, regular viewings with Ian are an opportunity to discuss the smallest of points. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, you all right? Okay. You all right? Not too yeah. bad. Good. Good. Not too bad. Yeah. yeah. OK, what do you think? Well, I think, I think it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. The definition of the cabin and the haunches sits just right. No, it's super, super. It's got all the power towards the front. And, uh, yeah, I love it. I really do. There's some subtle things we need to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's definitely getting there. Yeah. The body wide line that's just sliding through the car there, I think it could be just a little bit lower. Yeah. Just give it a bit more drama. Just a yeah. few minutes. Yeah, I was thinking if we hold this edge here, like that. OK. And then come down here. Yeah, that's it. Then you're going to drop it slightly. Yeah. OK, so we've got a little bit more drama in it. Simon, could we just have a look at this section here, just the fullness through here? Yeah. Maybe you put a tape on it, oh, just so we've got a feel yeah. the section. Thank you. Okay. I'm just wondering whether it might just be a little bit too full. Just on here? Yeah. Okay. Just go for it. <laughs> That's it. 
How much do you want off? About a millimetre, I'd okay. say. A millimetre and a half. I love the artistry of it. I love the idea that we uh, understand these surfaces as a piece of sculpture and we can see it evolving in front of us to get to the right shape. We're getting closer to the car that's inside this that we need to get to. It's like any sculpture. It's like you're chiseling away to get to that shape. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we kind of know when it's right. So that's a fun bit. I love that. That's it. OK. Excellent. Well done. Shall we uh, check the highlights on that one? Yes, please, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. A thin vinyl film called Dynock is used to check the finish on the clay. The shape and orientation of the overhead studio lights helps highlight any imperfections on the car's bodywork. Even the most minute flaws will need attending to. It's not bad, is it? But. Uh... I think we might have gone a little bit too far. It's just dipping towards the front. It is dipping it? towards yeah. the front, yeah. But we can fix that. It's going the right direction, definitely. Yeah. So okay. it's pretty good. You're good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. From concept drawing to clay model, it's a remarkable transformation. Digital scans of the model will be used to create the bodywork of the first prototype cars. Yet the finished shape of the I-Pace will not just result from the inspiration of designers and clay modelers. Engineers will also play a crucial role. And for many, like Imogen Pierce, inspiration starts young. So this is a merry-go-round I made when I was about seven years old, which my sister has kindly sent me. Um, I have to say I've not seen this for about 20 years, so I'm quite intrigued to see just what condition it's in. I remember how seriously I took this, but at the time we were asked to make some sort of mechanical project. And I think most people had made sort of cars and trains and I was fairly determined that I wanted to make a merry-go-round, which hopefully, if it still works, I might be able to show you. So there's um, definitely some repair work that needs going on. Hmm. <laughs> What's quite nice about projects like this is that I was able to see quite early on that engineering wasn't about spanners and overalls. It was about just creating something and trying to make something work. And so whilst I didn't know what an engineer was, I did know that I just loved creating stuff. And then the fact that that could actually end up being something that I do on a daily basis just happened to be a massive bonus, really. Imogen is an aerodynamics engineer. With battery range of such importance for the I-Pace, it's a crucial job. And one that will have a major bearing on the final design of the car. A lot of engineering is design build test. It's a case of doing something, does it work, learning from your findings. In many sense, it's a career that rewards getting things wrong as long as you know how to fix them. Oh, my God. We just snapped it. OK. This is quite fiddly. If this motor still works, I will be incredibly impressed. Oh! I'm so pleased. <laughs> OK. When you make something like this, it was a real labour of love. And I suppose that's the beauty of what I get to do every day, that you do things, you know, you put a lot of effort in, and then to see them work and see them in real life is so amazing. Which I'm very much getting now that I've got this to work as well. From the humble beginnings of a childhood merry-go-round, Imogen has travelled the world working on numerous projects. But her next trip is the most significant yet.
she's come to Germany for a crucial experiment, one that will influence the shape of the I-Pace and the range from its battery. And this is what's going to power the test. This is a full-scale wind tunnel, which can go up to 260 kilometers an hour. And it's something that is controlled just by a press of a button. So until you come in here, you have no idea exactly the sheer size of what's behind your test. And this really allows us to identify where key tweaks and changes and how they're impacting the rest of the flow on the vehicle. It's a really, really powerful visual technique for that. This is one of the first prototypes that we've actually built with a real bodywork, but we still have some prototype parts on the car itself. We've done lots of work on clay models, uh, calculations, but now this is a real car. Truth time. Developing a new car like the I-Pace, we would work at least two to three years to get a combination of a good-looking car that goes a long way on one charge of electricity. Tell us when to stop. It's our first electric vehicle, which means that something like aerodynamics is even more important. So, yeah, good. We have to try and optimise it as much as we possibly can. Even millimetres of changes hugely impacts the range of the vehicle. We looking good? Yeah. In the first part of the test, the team are analysing one of the I-PACE's most striking features, the air bypass. The bypass, it's oh, definitely yeah, working yeah. now. Yeah. Oh, lovely, that's really... Yeah. With no engine, the air flows in through the grill and out through the duct. So what we're able to see with the smoke is the air being diverted through that duct and actually creating a much better angle onto that front windscreen, which hugely impacts the aerodynamics and ultimately the range of the vehicle as well. Experiments like this help ensure that the finished car will slice cleanly through the air, greatly increasing the distance it will travel on a single charge. And with so much riding on the team's work here, Testing carries on into the night. You sometimes end up doing the night shifts, um, which can be a bit intense, but there are an awful lot of snacks to keep going. So uh, there's no risk of running out of biscuits. The hours are long, but for Imogen, working as an aerodynamics engineer is something her seven-year-old self could only have dreamed of. Can we see the um, interaction with the front wheel deflector? Yeah. We're definitely avoiding the, the smoke hitting the tyre. What I love about this job is that you can identify what you think might work or you think might make a difference. You can add it to the car. In real time, you're able to see what impact that's having. And can we have a look at the air curtain? And then you see it on the road. And to have that real tangible input into the process is it's just amazing. Back in the UK, the engineering team are working flat out on the I-Pace. It's now summer 2017, and they know that with every passing day, the public is becoming increasingly aware of the benefits electric vehicles will bring. 
One engineer in particular has been closely following the latest developments. Dr. Alex Michalides is one of the world's foremost experts in electrical machines, with over 60 scientific publications to his name. And today's headlines suggest that his moment has finally come. It's mid-July, and the British government has just announced plans to ban the sale of all new petrol and diesel cars from 2040. I think reading these headlines, you, you have to say that they are heading towards um, a, a, an electrified future. Dr. Michalides is the inventor of the iPACE's super-efficient electric motor. Powered by the battery, it will be integrated into the front and rear axles to provide all-wheel drive. The motor's patented design makes it exceptionally compact and lightweight, while giving a sports car-like performance. What is special about our electric motor is that it combines high torque density, high power density, efficiency, uh, performance at high speeds. If they can get it right, Dr. Michalides and his team are confident that Jaguar's unique new motor will help change drivers' views of electric vehicles forever. It's actually uh, quite exciting working on a project like this because you are designing it to have specific characteristics that will appeal to a driver well, and make the car exciting. But an exciting drive isn't the only benefit of the electric motor. It also provides something else too. Almost total silence. But this creates another challenge for the team. The I-Pace is so quiet that exterior noise could easily spoil the cabin's tranquility. So engineers are trying to identify where sound might enter the car. Hi. What we have here is an acoustic camera. So for instance, if I was to click like this, it moves to my fingers because of the high energy level created at my fingertips. That's better. Thank you. The team will be using the camera to analyze the dashboard of a prototype car. Okay, that's good. It just needs a tiny tweak towards the steering wheel. That there is the perfect view, wherever you've got that. Yeah, cool. That's perfect. Hey, mate, you're good to go. OK, Kev, firing up the rig. Working on the electric eye pace, is unlike anything the team have done previously. Before we started producing battery electric vehicles, we were working on diesel cars and petrol cars. In a way, the noise from the engine can, can help us because it provides a masking level. In this situation, we have no engine. It's a much more difficult task than it used to be. Engineering work like this builds upon Jaguar's long history of technological innovation. Ultimately, our aim is to create the most refined battery electric vehicle on the market today. Whether that's road noise, motor noise, wind noise, anything, we need to just get down to as low a level as possible. But making a near silent electric car creates another challenge. Like all Jaguars, the I Pace is designed to be fun. Ian Suffield's job is to ensure it sounds fun too. When you remove the, the engine noise from the car, what you've lost is the engaging and the dynamic reward that you get from driving. The sound is what rewards people. When they discuss good sounding cars, it's all about the engine note and the fast revving and the, from the race car type snarls through to the powerful V8. Ian is a specialist audio engineer 
with a background in sound design. I've spent over 20 years here, most of the time making cars quiet. And only recently have we actually had the, the technology to start really meticulously engineering the sounds that we want. Because the I-Pace has no engine noise, Jaguar has created its own external acoustic signal. At low speeds, it will warn pedestrians of the vehicle's approach. Inside the car, a carefully tuned soundtrack can also play should the driver choose. If I just start with the, the first car model that we've got, I will then go in and add some sound at about somewhere between sort of 50 to 100 kilometers an hour, such that it represents when you're accelerating up, so you get the sense of power of the car. The driver will be able to select the intensity of the sound, from dynamic to near silent. The next layer of sound I introduce to, to progress is from about 100 kilometers upwards. This is where the sound starts getting a little bit edgier, a little bit sharper. So this is us absolutely flooring it, and we've got our lovely race car howl there. You get the real sense of actually, you really want to pull this car forward. And it's in line with our heritage. It's, you know, we have a history of making great sounding, really fast cars. So uh, this one needs to be no exception. But an exciting sounding car isn't enough. The team also wanted to be tough. So they've brought a prototype to Jaguar's proving ground to gather data that will be used in an extreme lab test of the car's robustness. Sophisticated sensors fitted by the engineers will record how the I-Pace copes with major bumps on the road. Okay, Doug, we're ready. A fully instrumented prototype can cost around one million pounds. But that doesn't mean it will be given an easy ride. The car is driven over a purpose-built course designed to mimic the worst possible road surfaces. The onboard sensors constantly record the movement of the wheels and suspension. 84,000 recordings are made each second, providing the real-world data needed for extreme testing. Back here at Jaguar's structural test rig, where the team are preparing an eye pace for a high tech and high impact experiment. They've programmed the rig using the data recorded on the test track to replicate a lifetime's severe driving. This hydraulic rig simulates the road. Each of the inputs into the vehicle is through where the wheel would be it has the capability to actually destroy the vehicle if it's not correctly connected up to each corner. The rig will run at a pressure of 3,000 pounds per square inch, the equivalent of being more than two kilometers under the ocean. Okay, right. This will be the I-PACE's toughest test yet. The car will be given no respite. The test here will run for the next eight weeks, with the rig perfectly reproducing the impacts recorded out on the track. We test it thoroughly before it goes to the customer, so we know that we are confident with the durability of the vehicle. Chassis, suspension and bodywork. The entire car will be monitored throughout. The I-PACE, it's a new step for us but from a structural engineer point of view, we still test it to the same level as we would any other product. But there's more to this car than its robustness. The I-PACE is engineered to give an exhilarating high-speed performance in all weathers. So the team have come to southern Italy at the height of the Mediterranean summer for a punishing round of track tests. 
This is the Nardo Ring, a banked circle of tarmac so large it can be seen from space. It is one of the few places on Earth where cars can be constantly pushed to the limit. It's August 2017, and the I-Pace is being tested at maximum velocity. VMAX. The focus is on ride and handling. But regular pit stop safety checks are essential. OK, yep. Yeah. Clear. Okay. Clear. Good drive. Yep. Yeah. It's quite breezy out there, but the car feels good and stable at VMAX. Track temp, ambient temp? Yeah, 34 degrees. OK, okay. yep. Yeah. OK. OK. With the temperature rising through the mid-30s... OK, your side? Yeah, OK, this side. ..the team carefully monitor the heat generated by the car's constant high-speed cornering. The car's going through a hell of a test with, with that temperature and the speed that it's doing. So we have to keep a, a close eye on the wear and tear of the brake pads. Some of them can reach up to 650 degrees. The car is in and out. We've got four guys each corner of the car. And then when we drop it down and we're all happy with the car and it's safe to go, no issues, swap drivers, it's straight back out. Coming down. It's hot, tiring work. You ready, Steve? Clear. Yet the team are determined that the I-Pace will handle as well as any conventional sports car. Multiple drivers are used throughout the day, okay. with the car performing relentless high-speed laps. But Italy was only part of the story. Nice, good to go. Over the next six months, the team worked on a gruelling test programme, covering every conceivable terrain. and clocking up 1.5 million miles worldwide. Yet another challenge still remained. It's now January 2018, and the I-Pace has arrived in northern Sweden for driving dynamics testing on the region's frozen lakes. With only about four and a half hours of daylight and temperatures approaching minus 40, it's an opportunity to validate battery performance in Arctic conditions and an extreme test of the car's all-wheel drive system. Pace's journey from initial sketch is now complete. More than four years of dedicated effort have resulted in an all-electric performance SUV with a 0 to 60 time of 4.5 seconds and a top speed of 124 miles per hour. It's a world away from the traditional Jaguars of yesteryear. There's only one more job to go. manufacturing. It's now February 2018. At the factory where the I-Pace will be built, production is ramping up. Getting this far has been a major achievement for Jaguar. And with cars coming down the production line, the team's thoughts start turning to the moment that the I-Pace will be revealed to the public. 
It's always a happy occasion for us when the vehicles reveal because we've seen it work through it from the idea all the way to the final reveal. We've been through it, I guess, from birth to when it graduates. Something that you've worked on yourself, you know, and had input in, is it's a really, really amazing feeling. You feel like you've sort of achieved something. It's a great moment. It's a moment to, to relish. And it's, um, it's like seeing it being born, really. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason we are all here today, please show your appreciation for the stunning new Jaguar I-Pace. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the brand new Jaguar I-Pace and its designer, Ian Callum, Director of Design. <laughs> wow, wow. Can I just like say, it. so damn stylish. You must be so proud. It looks, very it looks proud. amazing. We're all very proud of it, yeah. It's been a momentous few years. The car that electricity has been waiting for. But for Ian, there's one final part of the journey to go. It's now spring 2018, and an I-Pace is finally out on the road. Ian's been looking forward to this day ever since the project began. So this is actually my first time on the public roads in an I-Pace. And I have to say, it feels absolutely wonderful. I feel immensely proud, of course. But it's also a very pleasurable car to drive. How smooth is that, eh? The serenity of it, the quietness of it, is something that uh, is very obvious when you first drive it. Also, the acceleration of it is instant. It's amazing. The creation of this car is perhaps Ian's greatest achievement, the culmination of the journey he started as a boy. I think back of being a 13-year-old and think if somebody had told me we were building an electric car with 400 horsepower of this shape, I would have been hugely impressed. And it certainly wasn't in my psyche at that point to think we could ever reach something this advanced. It feels hugely significant to be here, I have to say. But the significance of the I-PACE's launch goes much further. So on the 1st of March this year, 2018, we launched the I-PACE. And it was pointed out to me, of course, the letter I received from Jaguar was also the 1st of March in 1968, exactly 50 years to the day. If somebody had said to me, one day, 50 years from now, this is what you'll be doing, I'd have found that very difficult to believe. All I wanted to do was to sit in an office and draw cars and design them. I never really dreamt that I would be director of design for Jaguar, for one thing, and I certainly never dreamt I'd be designing futuristic electric cars. Yet the story of the futuristic I-Pace doesn't end here. New York, 27th of March, 2018. Journalists gathered for a press conference are in for a big surprise. On stage, John Krafcek, head of Waymo, the world leader in autonomous driving technologies. I'd like to introduce to you all the world's first premium electric fully self-driving car.
we're going to design and engineer a self-driving Jaguar I-Pace equipped with Waymo technology. For Jaguar and its engineers and designers, the I-Pace is only the beginning. What's fascinating about it, as it evolved in front of us, when we got to, to the, the final stages of I-Pace, I started to realize something. This is a template for the future. This is it. This is a point of change that we must grasp and make the most of. This is the future Jaguar. This is the car that will take us into the next generation.